we'll have to try and work out how to deal with some of those. There are some good ones there. Um, this final session is uh, entitled Understanding the Science, um, Preparing to uh, Adapt. And our first speaker for this final session is Adam Hosking. Adam uh, is a global practice director with CH2M with responsibility for water resources, including flood and coastal risk management and climate change adaptation services. He's a fellow of uh, CIWEM and a chartered scientist. He's got 22 years professional experience, including five years working in the States, and he's provided technical leadership for coastal and marine climate adaptation studies in many parts of the world, including the UK, the USA, the Caribbean, the Middle East, and Singapore, and now Brussels. Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, all. Um, firstly, I must excuse my throat. If it sounds like I'm getting very emotional, I am. I love this stuff, but I'll hopefully make it through 15 minutes. So it is my pleasure to change tack to look at the other side of the climate challenge for us. What I'm going to talk about is to really kind of start with this afternoon's session, really laying the foundations for a, moving into how do we adapt to the climate change that we're committed to as we go forward today. So the background to this problem that we've heard through the rest of this morning and, and this afternoon, really about trying to manage climate change down you know, many of the the pathways that we, Caroline presented some pathways, those pathways and how we go down those in terms of managing our carbon emissions into the future have a big, big part of, of what I'm going to talk about in terms of the uncertainty and, and our inability as science to, to pin down exactly what the climate is going to be in 75 years time because we just don't know which of those emission pathways we're going to go down. So my brief is to, to talk a little bit about interpreting the science. <clears throat> Uh, hopefully coming up with a somewhat practical approach. There are different ways of dealing with the science. Our good friends, the sharks there, have read some research. They've come out with a projection and they know what they're going to do. They're making a plan. So we can do this. There's climate data out there. And we can, we can just be pragmatic. We can act. We don't need to wait for the, to know exactly when the sea level is going to reach their dinner. They know they can wait longer. I spent a lot of time doing this. The big problem we have with climate change adaptation is all of this noise, right? There's an awful lot of very, very, very good science out there. There's an awful lot that we do understand, but actually the, the layman, the casual reader or reviewer of our understanding of future climate change is very, very easily confused. What do we know? What don't we know? There's so much stuff. Look at the newspaper, look on any website, any day of the week, any year of the year, any month of the year. You'll find a different story and quite often you'll get different reports, depending on the, the objectives of the writer. So we tend to get very hung up on uncertainty and this is the real challenge that we need to face. But what I'd rather we did is look at the certainty, what we do know. There are various resources out there that we can look at which actually try and demystify some of this. This is one that I've picked on because it helps present the story, but there are a number of different reports out there which actually present the certainty, what we understand about climate change. This handbook, and I put a number of website references and reports and so on throughout the presentation. You'll have access to this presentation, so um, you'll be able to follow up on any of this. One of the most telling statistics from this report is that there's a 97% consensus, according to this piece of research, amongst climate scientists, that there is man-induced climate change. So we, as society, are having an impact on climate and we're changing that climate. And we gen generally know the direction of that change and broadly what the implications are. And in that context, what we as owners, operators, managers of infrastructure, maritime, port and navigation infrastructure, need to be doing is not worrying about the uncertainty, but considering and dealing with the risks. The quote here talks about how in any other walk of life, if we had something approaching a 
level of certainty on some sort of action or change, and we would do something about it. That's good risk management. And we would be foolish to not do so. And that's really the kind of the key that I want you to take away from my presentation. And it's not like we're starting from scratch. It's not like we don't know the direction that climate might change, and we don't know what the impacts might be. Many of you will hopefully be very aware of this website, this organization that's brought us here today, and a lot of very, very good work that's out there in terms of resources about understanding what phenomena such as sea level rise or storm events and changes in sea chemistry or ice conditions might mean for the infrastructure that we're owning, operating, managing, that we're making our business of. And there are very good technical notes approaching subjects like sea level rise and, and waves and how they change and what the consequences might be in the ports and maritime sector. Those are relatively high level. If you look and you understand the resources you're looking at, there are some very, very detailed, very, very good other resources out there as well. This from CSIRO in Australia goes right into the weeds of analyzing <coughs> climate change impacts on the deterioration of con concrete infrastructure. There's information out there on what, what climate change might mean for your infrastructure. If we can get over the hump of worrying about exactly how much climate change is going to be, then there's plenty of resources out there to understand what the consequences might be, what the risks might be for you as infrastructure owners and operators. This is probably my most important slide. This is the piece where we really mustn't get hung up. As much as my bosses and me as a ruthless consultant, I'm told to go out and get as much money as I can, you don't need to start with a million dollar study on exactly what climate change is going to mean for your port, your harbour, your navigation waterway. What we really want to do is tailor our approach to climate risks to the problem. Lots and lots of very good research out there which tells us broadly the direction of climate change, broadly the nature of the impacts that that might have in different sectors, and the sorts of responses we might take to them. With that information, and most importantly, a good understanding of your own infrastructure and your own operations, we can sit down and have that first workshop to say, okay, guys, what might this mean for us? And it might well be that actually for you, you might not have such a big problem. So day to day, we don't think it's a, a, a problem. If we look out a few years, then maybe there may or maybe there may not be a problem. In all likelihood, given that you guys are really kind of at the front edge of where climate change is likely to hit, i.e. at the coast, then um, probably you will look out a bit further into the future and yeah, a foot of sea level rise, 10, 20 centimetres of sea level rise, might start impacting your operations. So then you start moving down this chain. So do the workshop, broadly consider that there probably might be some sort of impact that we want to understand a bit better, and you go down the steps. You don't need to jump straight to the bottom. You don't need to jump straight to hiring consultants to come in and do big modelling studies and come up with a massive adaptation plan. You want to look at what it means, and you can go down this process, because the further you go down, the more time and the greater cost associated with doing that. So I think the, this is the really important message for me, is that we kind of start at the top, are we likely to have a problem, and then we go down levels of detail. And I'll show a few examples of what some of these things look like. I've talked about some of the resources that help us understand what the impacts might be, and how we, what climate change might look like as it manifests itself. You then want to know, okay, so, so what kind of climate change might I be dealing with? And again, there are an awful lot of very good resources out there that help us relatively quickly get a feel for what climate change might look like for me. The first and the kind of the, the daddy of all our climate work is the work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Their fifth assessment report, which came out in 2013, is the current working version. We've seen various graphs looking like this projecting out into the future. These are effectively emission scenarios. So this one has a slight change from the past, but these representative concentration pathways speak to various concentrations of atmospheric CO2 uh, greenhouse gases and what that means for climate. So that's our big uncertainty. That comes back to our, our mitigation pathways, our carbon pathways. Those are all related to emissions into the future and then what that means for, for the atmosphere and, and changes in climate. That report gives you global numbers. But building on that report, <coughs> are all sorts of other resources. So the second working group produces a more regional report which starts looking at smaller, well, you know, still globally very large geographies, but refining in terms of what climate change might look like, what the impacts might be broadly, some of the adaptations that might be taken at the broadest scale. 
we can keep going down. There are various other resources out there which will get us to taking some of this very hard science and putting it into tangible, workable terms. And if you want to get very local, and this is just a very, very, very small subset of everything that's out there, different countries, different regions, different organizations, built on that IPCC fifth assessment for um, data and science, are producing regionally, locally, sector-specific guidance, which gives you very quickly a good handle on what it might mean for you, where you are or what you are. One that we use consistently is a piece of software, frankly, called um, SimClim, which is produced by a company in New Zealand, and that helps you take data from these global climate models and produce something that's useful for you. Different people have different tools. This is just the one that I'm going to use. On those graphs with the expanding cones, it's showing things changing over time and getting ever increasingly wider and less certain, um, are a real challenge for us. Like, what number do we pick? Where do we work? We very routinely, in trying to address this, work with scenarios. And this would be fairly common to all of you. An example from a project in the Caribbean that we worked on, we took this SimClim tool and asked it what future sea level rise might look like. That's a subset of all the data that it spits out from all of these global climate models. This is a projection year on year from 1995 through to the year 2100. There's data from 24 global climate models. There's the four um, emissions concentration pathways. And these are just slices through these. That's the 10th, the 50th, and 90th um, percentile ranges in that. Even with that being a very small subset, there's still 13, 1500 data points there. And we can't work with that. Nobody can work with that. And that's where, that's the uncertainty embodied. That's what people get hung up on. And we mustn't. So we worked with the client in this instance, um, the government of um, Trinidad and Tobago. I said, okay, what sort of timescales do we want to look over? And they agreed that sort of 15, 20 years out, 40, and then at the end of the century are probably the sorts of things they want to understand when they're investing in infrastructure, developing building codes, and that sort of thing at the coast. That's what they want to understand. We can take slices through those four RCPs. That gets us to a much, much more discrete set of points. We then said, okay, of those, the RCP 4.5 and the 8.5 are a mid-range and a high range within all that range of data. Let's take one which is about the medium, that's the 4.5 column, and let's take an upper end, more extreme, somewhat worst case scenario, and we can work with those numbers. So we've gone very quickly from 1,300 data points to six, a very, very much more manageable set of numbers. And we broadly plan for the RCP 4.5, to ensure that whatever designing or building we know can be adapted to the 8.5 column. So we're straight, we're back into, as an engineer, sorts of terms that we can work with, we can actually do something with these. And you can then sit down and say, okay, if I have 14 centimeters of sea level rise, or 26 centimeters of sea level rise, what does that mean? And it's pretty easy to actually understand that, relatively speaking. These are some slides I've taken from a presentation I did back in 2007 to the American Association of Port Authorities when we were looking at these hypotheticals. So taking a, a hypothetical breakwater, taking some hypothetical sea level rise numbers, what do they mean in terms of performance of my breakwater? If sea level goes up like that and everything else stays the same, <coughs> excuse me, then the overtopping of my breakwater with a half a meter sea level rise is an increase of about 72%. Gives you very quickly a feel for, is that likely to be a problem or not? We did the same with the key wall it's a vertical structure, the problem was worse. So doubling of overtopping of that sort of structure with a half a meter of sea level rise. Sorts of things that can tell you it's a really very straightforward calculation, can tell you pretty quickly the sorts of order of magnitude problem you might have if that scenario transpired. And so we can take that kind of thinking through to the whole of this process. So very quick, three projects. On the largest of scale, the Khalifa Port mega project, mega port project designed um, in Abu Dhabi. Very, very pragmatic decision taken with a client that will assume five millimeters of sea level rise per annum going forward to ensure that this design is resilient against future climate change. We don't know if that's going to be right. It probably won't be right, but it ensures we are resilient. And we're designing a port that we know can be adapted around that. In the UK, a couple of years ago, there's a section of railway line which was famously washed out completely planning the, the design of the, the new structures there. It's at the coast, it's in a geotechnically unstable area, it faces all sorts of challenges. So the different um, 
rows in that table are all the different climate metrics we needed to consider. But again, we've just taken two years, 2065, 2115, and looked at the range of a high, a medium, and a low. And we designed for the medium. We're resilient against the high. We're designing for something that can be adapted to the high. And the low is used purely for business planning. If in a very, very best case scenario, nothing really much happened, then are we, are we still making sound investments? And at the most granular level, we're working with the Met Office in the UK and have considered very, very high resolution, one and a half kilometer grid square climate models that are able to resolve convective rainfall. So when we're looking at drainage, drainage being obviously a critically important aspect of ports, and what does future climate mean if we get to that very high kind of weather modeling scale? And we see that when we can start resolving these convective storms, and actually we see a big increase in rainfall. Very, very detailed answer to a very, very detailed question just demonstrates the levels of design and detail we can go to with this. But we can start with a simple five millimeters a year, and that's just as good. To finish with the kind of, uh, so what point study that we did um, for the city of New York following Hurricane Sandy, um, where we looked at the resilience of all of their water and wastewater infrastructure. So we looked at retrofit options for all 14 of their wastewater treatment plants, 60 pumping stations, and to cut to the answer, by taking a incremental approach to making their infrastructure more resilient, whereby uh, we built more resilient options into their um, operations and maintenance plans for all their infrastructure, we estimated that as that changes over time by considering future climate, we could save of the order of one and a half, sorry, two and a half billion dollars in just disruption damages, damages to 1.1 billion of assets, with a total cost of Three, $315 million, which is a massive price tag, but they're building it incrementally as they go along. So it's just built into the operations and maintenance. It's not capital projects. <coughs> Excuse me, there it goes. Nearly made it to the end. But that's incrementally built into as they do their business. Don't, don't replace like for like, replace for resilient. But that's all about having thought about climate and built it into your future plans. So to conclude, don't worry about 13 100 data points, take three, take six. Simplify your vulnerability analysis. Have that meeting, have that discussion. Are we vulnerable? If so, what? Focus on that. And then integrate your climate change planning into everything. Build it into your O&M become, so it becomes part of your day-to-day -day business. It doesn't then have this massive capital cost. Don't wait. Just do it. Thank you.